having a horse that wants to stay, that wants to stay here, is not ready to cross over, is not ready to, to hang it up, is a big part of it, but also understand that time and emotional commitment that you're making to that horse and managing them effectively and letting them give themselves a chance to heal. If you don't do that, there's not a chance. founder of Equitopia. In this, the final of our four-part series on sudden lameness, we explore the various aspects of rehabilitation from minor to severe injuries. We also look at some aspects of rehab that are frequently overlooked, such as the mental and neurological components on which a successful rehab may depend. When horses have had long-term problems, um, their muscle memory and various neural pathways don't function normally, and we have to try and re-engage that. After there's been an injury, the horse's body adapts to the pain by altering its posture and gait. And it may be that the longer the horse has been lame, the more likely it is to habitually move in a compensatory way. The longer something goes on unchecked, the more it becomes what we call plastic in the body. The body actually assimilates and believes that that's how it's supposed to be. What we do in vet med to investigate whether there's a painful condition is we sometimes do analgesic testing for a period of time, or we do nerve blocks and look for improvement. But it never makes a horse 100%. And that's because there's some of these residual pathways and those are important to realize that they're going to be there for a while. Neuropathic pain. Once that pain has been removed, the brain does not automatically reprocess to use the original motor pattern for movement. What that means for the horse is that movement remains as an adapted gait. After an injury, horses may habitually move incorrectly and they may also suffer from persistent behavioral issues. Oftentimes when we have found the pain and have cured the pain, the behavior can persist due to negative emotional associations. So essentially a successful rehab program is more than just healing a tendon or a ligament. It's about resetting the horse's central nervous system to function physically and emotionally optimally. And it all starts with an accurate diagnosis from your veterinarian. The management of a horse once we've reached a diagnosis is going to obviously depend on what the underlying cause of the problem was. Some horses don't require long or complicated rehab programs. If the horse, for example, has got arthritic change in a fetlock joint and we've medicated the fetlock joint, um, there may not be other problems that are going along us alongside that so walking exercise for a week and then slowly resuming normal work may be all that is required. Sometimes rehabilitation can take months or even years but before targeted physiotherapies and movement retraining can take place the basics need to happen. Whatever the underlying problem absolutely essential that we address foot balance and the way in which the horse is trimmed and shod. If we ignore that, we're going to have recurrent problems. It is absolutely fundamental. So we have to work in conjunction with a skilled farrier whom we trust. The team approach in rehabilitation is really key. Proactive liaison between the owner, the veterinarian, the trainer, the therapist, the saddle fitter, the nutritionist, the farrier, the dentist, essentially anyone who's involved in the process of rehabilitation of that horse. For soft tissue injuries, many veterinarians employ the use of ultrasound imaging. Ultrasound imaging provides the most detailed imaging information available about the internal architecture of tendon. The baseline ultrasound exam gives us parameters to not only determine how severe the injury is, the extent of it um, to a degree, the chronicity of it and uh, the extent of new, newly injured fibers, but it also provides us a reference for the future so we can assess how the tendon is healing or not healing and make adjustments accordingly. Rehabilitation will be different for every horse. But in general, many veterinarians worldwide follow Dr. Gillis's protocol. 
My rehab protocol consists of stall rest, which is generally a 12 foot by 24 foot area maximum. Now some athletic courses can do quite a bit in that size, but uh, that's usually our maximum down to 12 by 12. The horse should get out of the stall at least twice a day. I start hand walking on day one. Uh, unless I'm concerned about complete tendon rupture, which is a tenth of a percent of the cases. The length of time that the horse walks depends on the severity of the injury and uh, how sound he is. If he is sound at a walk, he will walk longer. If not sound at the walk, he'll walk a very short period of time. We gradually increase our exercise level based on our ultrasound findings. Generally, we walk for approximately four months, and that's partially hand walk partially tack walk plus hand walk. And then we increase to trot based on our ultrasound findings. And trot is a biggie because trot puts twice as much load on the forelimbs of the horse as walk does. So it's a big increase in exercise. So we introduce trot very gradually and incrementally. And then ultimately we add canter. And we don't turn horses out until they have been cantering for at least a week. So that's generally about month six of our rehab. Basically, we can think of it as we're healing the tendon, but we're also training the horse back up to not only his uh, athletic sport, but also training him up for turnout because most equine athletes will do a little running around in pasture. And even if it's a few minutes a day, that is uh, quite a load on the tendon. I generally recommend ultrasound examinations at six to eight week intervals. And the purpose of this is I like to examine horses when I think that they're going to be able to go up to the next exercise level. At some point during the rehab, usually when the horse has been trotting for a period of time, I like to do a full lameness exam and I like to do it in the middle of the rehab so that we can detect and address any other issues that the horse has that have not been brought to light to date so that we don't get to the end of the rehab and then start dealing with uh, a joint issue somewhere else. Dr. Sue Dyson advocates the importance of keeping horses out of the arena whenever possible during early ridden work, which includes lots of hacking in straight lines on various surfaces, terrains and gradients. She believes that it's not only good for the musculoskeletal system and proprioception, but also helps maintain the horse's mental health. Along with stall rest and progressive exercise, many rehab programs utilize targeted physiotherapy. I want those horses to be going through a fairly intensive manual therapy type of thing so that they're doing carrot stretch exercises to mobilize the back, mobilize the neck, um, engage the abdominal core muscles because I think we need to have the horse as strong as possible when it goes back into ridden exercise. In terms of designing an appropriate rehabilitation program for the horse, the first step comes from the treating veterinarian so that the owner has an accurate diagnosis of the condition and and then together with the veterinarian, the most appropriate therapy can be sought to support that horse during each phase of the rehabilitation. In early stages of rehabilitation, approaches such as the use of laser therapy, um, any electrotherapies, hot and cold therapy uh, may be used um, before moving on to more global modalities such as soft tissue therapies um, and then indeed progressing into dynamic movement retraining. And each stage is carefully re-evaluated by the vet and the therapist. Nicole starts with a thorough evaluation. Generally, each assessment will start with a static examination, which will involve evaluation of muscle tone, so looking for any areas of sensitivity, of reactivity, but also I pay strong attention to symmetry of muscling, so left to right side symmetry. So for example, if I evaluate the horse from the front to look at the shoulder musculature, whether that is developed evenly, the lower neck musculature, the pectoral musculature, and importantly also the muscles of the limb. Because where there has been an injury in the lower limb, quite often you will see a secondary or a neurogenic atrophy that is developed higher up. From a therapeutic perspective, it's important to understand where such an atrophy may have happened and how that can be addressed through therapeutic intervention. Also, if you've had a focal injury, checking out the area to see whether or not there is any new swelling heat, any unexplained lumps or bumps, so that uh, the therapist has a starting point from where to work. Next, 
Nicole conducts a dynamic assessment of the horse in motion. So generally this will include walk and trot in a straight line on a soft and a hard surface, um, and then work on the lunge, um, left and right sides, walk, trot, canter, and ideally watch the horse being ridden, so under saddle, because the horse without the rider is very different to the horse with the rider, particularly if something shows up under the rider, but it may not be evident in hand or on the ground. Once the static and dynamic evaluations are finished, the actual therapy session can start. And that, for me personally, involves a combination of soft tissue, myofascial release, massage, uh, and then followed by any low-grade joint mobilizations. And these are then followed by specific activation exercises to initiate movement retraining. It's not sufficient to merely release areas that might be tight or tense, but to then look for specific reactivations of muscle groups that may not be firing optimally. And this is where it's so interesting to come in from a therapeutic perspective to see where we can break or alter that motor control pattern. Because once the pain element has been removed, we can once again work with reprogramming movement in its most optimal way. So these are really useful core musculature activations to do before any ridden work, such as bringing the horse over to the side Beautiful. So the key there as well is that it's not a ballistic reach around, grab the treat movement, but an activation with a sustained hold of about five seconds. In bringing the nose between the front legs, you should see a really good abdominal activation. Good. So that was actually too big almost for this horse, but essentially that is not so much of a stretch as a true activation of your abdominal muscles, which are part of your core musculature. To help with dynamic movement retraining, Nicole designed a core strengthening system called Equicore. The Equiband system is very useful in that proprioceptive stimulus um, during movement of the key core muscles, so the abdominal tunic. Nicole assigns activation exercises as homework to her clients. And that really is key. Again, you can initiate a change in movement retraining, but in order for that to become established, it needs to be repeated for the brain to integrate that as a normal pathway. Remember, physiotherapy is not a one-size-fits-all. Two horses recovering from tendon lesions may have very different stages through which they progress. So again, it's very important to evaluate and re-evaluate what you find on a given day. Chiropractic and acupuncture are also included in many rehab programs. So what is chiropractic and how exactly does it work? The short answer is that we are modulating the nervous system. We are doing this through a hands-on therapy using touch to address areas of disaffrontation or deaffrontation, which basically means that we have a neuromuscular weakness. By applying a stimulus through our hands, we are waking up areas that have otherwise gone to sleep, alleviating areas of tension. When you have tension in a soft tissue, you are actually decreasing blood flow to that area. When we decrease blood flow, we're affecting the nerves in that area as well. So we're using a hands-on application to alleviate that tension, increase circulation in that area, and fire the nerves so that the soft tissues in an area can go back to a normal state of health and thus allow the bones or the joints in that area to track in a normal range of motion. Just like chiropractic and some of the other modalities, it works by neuromodulation. We are influencing the body's nervous system, circulation, and the immune system. How do we do that? The acupuncture points themselves are located typically over nerve endings, blood vessels, and little pools of cells called mast cells, which release histamine and modulate the immune system. When we insert a needle into one of these points, and they may be at different depths, from very superficial to four to six inches deep, if we're talking about some of the gluteal points on a horse's rump, we are seeking a response called a De Qi response that literally means the arrival of energy. We are targeting these nerve endings, blood vessels, and pools of mast cells to try to wake up an area in the body and say, come here, heal this, or to tune it down and tone it down to suppress an overreactive response. 
Endorphins are mother nature's painkillers. When we provide an acupuncture treatment, some of the side effects that you'll see in the patient are licking and chewing, maybe a droopy lower lip, and yawning. These are secondary effects to these good neurotransmitters, these beneficial endorphins being released into the body that provide relaxation and pain relief. We've talked about reprogramming the nervous system for optimal movement. But what happens when chronic pain has neurologically hardwired emotional responses, such as fear? The problem with pain is that it can often lead to fear. It can create an association with either a location, a person, or a certain tool, which then leads to anxiety. How do we retrain the brain? So let's say we had a horse with chronic pain, and now this horse has associated a particular event with pain. Therefore, fear, aversion to that event, and now therefore a behavior. What can we do? We can work with that horse with positive reinforcement associated with certain activity to try to break that cycle. In order to change a negative emotional response to a positive re emotional response, we have to do a process called desensitization and counter conditioning, which means we have to go in such small steps that we never see the unwanted behavior and pair that with a really strong positive emotional response to create a new experience. You've gotten a correct diagnosis. You've balanced your horse's feet. You've hand walked for miles. Your team communicates effectively. You've gotten follow-up imaging. You've done body work, brain work, and emotional retraining. But one of the most important things you can do for your horse is ask why. You need to ask, so why did this tendon injury occur in the first place? Um, it's more common for a tendon to injure a few fibers at a time uh, than it is to have a one-off accident. Those do happen, but far more common, probably 70, 75% of tendon injuries are a slow process, which gives us an opportunity to detect them early if we're looking carefully. Dr. Karen Liebrandt believes it's important to correct crookedness, imbalance, and tension as you return your horse to soundness. It's my experience as a trainer and a veterinarian that it's really important for a horse, if he is crooked, to make him straight. And one of the most important things to do that is body work and then correct training. The body work can make it possible for a horse to work again and of course all the other veterinarian treatments. But then you have to train the horse to strengthen his body, to balance him and to make him straight. And what can cause rehab to fail? It is time consuming, boring, tedious and there is poor client compliance. In those clients that stick with it, they can get good results, but they've really got to be patient and be prepared to keep at it. And when all is said and done and the blood, sweat and tears of rehab is over, you may still have to reevaluate what level of performance your horse can go back to. We know in our professional athletes, they have a limited amount of time they can do the high performance. And we need to look at it the same way with a horse from a welfare point of view is that horse may be better doing something a lot less intense. And remember, you are your horse's best advocate. A good practitioner should be able to discuss with you what they're doing and how it works. If you have a question or something's happening that you're not sure about, don't be afraid to speak up. Sometimes writing that down ahead of time or making notes as you're going through a treatment can be helpful. Oftentimes we are overrun thinking that, well, we're just the horse owner, we don't know anything because we have a professional standing in front of us. But trust your gut instinct. If something looks like it's not right, be sure to speak up and advocate for your horse's health. If you find our videos helpful on your path to compassionate horsemanship, we invite you to join our community. For more videos and information, please visit our website at equitopiacenter.com.